But first I want to talk about something other than the society as a collective body, and think of ways in which all of us as individuals can give the profession of architectural history a greater role in the civic discourse. I had the privilege of studying with and working with two architectural historians whose entire careers, we might say, were a demonstration of the potential of architectural history to play this civic role, Vincent Scully and Ada Louise Huxtable. Scully, of course, was within the academy, Huxtable outside of it. I had the privilege of writing an obituary tribute to her in the next issue of the journal. And at one point in this piece, I observed that she, probably more than anyone else in our time, demonstrated the potential of a trained architectural historian to do serious and meaningful work outside of the academy. First at the Museum of Modern Art, later as a writer, and then, of course, as the critic of the New York Times, where her influence was legendary. And I think it's fair to say that her impact on the architectural discourse was enormous. The combination of her knowledge and judgment and the reach of the New York Times turned out to have a profound effect. But Scully is in some ways a more intriguing example because he was so much closer to a traditional academic. And the center of his professional life was always his teaching and his research. But some of my most vivid memories of being a student are of the times when he demonstrated his commitment to the principles of architecture and planning that he was teaching us about by showing how they applied in the ongoing struggle over urban renewal in his home city of New Haven. Scully was a passionate advocate of neighborhoods there, a crusader against the flawed notion in the 1960s that suburbanizing the city would save it. He lectured about it, he testified at public hearings and public meetings. His role as an advocate, I might even say using David Lewis's term, an agitator, did not compromise his role as an academic. Quite the contrary. Everything he said and did was consistent with his academic work and could be described as taking his ideas out of the classroom and into the civic realm, broadening their impact without compromising them. I have a particularly strong memory of being in his undergraduate class in 1970, the year of Yale's famous demonstrations against the Black Panther trial. Now that is ancient history, I know. <laughs> but suffice it to say that American campuses were in a state of outright rebellion in that year for many reasons, though primarily because of opposition to the Vietnam War. And many schools were shut down entirely. Yale responded to the crisis by temporarily, and I quote, suspending normal academic expectations. <laughs> now, now there's a brilliantly crafted phrase. <laughs> making it clear that the university was not giving in to certain forces by closing, nor was it ignoring them by trying to push ahead and pretend they didn't exist. Now, most professors interpreted suspending normal academic expectations as meaning they could cancel their classes and push back deadlines on papers. Scully, however, held his class, but changed his lecture topic to a new lecture he prepared over the preceding couple of days on the connections between architecture and justice, and on the ways in which architecture could or could not contribute to a just and equitable society. He began by saying that it was no time for the academy to shut itself down, that it was absolutely a time for the academy to shift direction, at least for a short while, and to think about how its knowledge might be put to use to benefit a society that was, at that moment, unquestionably in crisis. That was 43 years ago, and those words that the academy should not stand aside, but should try to see how academic, academic knowledge might contribute to the solutions we needed at that moment, have remained with me ever since. Now, I don't, I don't want to focus too much on that one particular scholar, but I do want to quote also three words of his that are also further relevant to our subject right now. In the afterword to a second edition of his 1969 book, American Architecture and Urbanism, its entire text, kind of an 
explicit statement of the belief that the architectural historian has a public role, Scully defined art history, and by implication, architectural history, as, and I quote, conservative, experimental, and ethical. It's a remarkable trio of words, actually, not least because it seems, at first hearing, almost contradictory. How can something be conservative and experimental? But to think about it for a moment and ponder the exquisite balance of ideas and principles inherent in it. Architectural history must be conservative, since understanding and honoring the great work of the past is central to its very reason for being. At the same time, it should be determinedly experimental, since one of the greatest gifts honoring the past can give us is to help us unleash the highest and best new ideas in the present. And it must be profoundly ethical, since surely the noblest mission of architectural history is to encourage the building of community and hence of civilization. 